Um, yeah, first of all, I, I got to say thank you for the opportunity for the series. That's been a we're, we're actually going to be at a year next month, uh, and it's been a really cool forum to kind of meet the other surgeons around the country, especially in a a year where you know we haven't really had conferences. I'm sure that's impacted everyone, but I can tell you as a young surgeon where you really want to go more to find out what you're doing right and doing wrong and make connections early on in your career. Uh, it's been tough not to have that. So uh, it's been a cool outlet for us to make friends, build relationships and kind of discuss these topics that we're all talking about in the doctor's lounge anyway. Um, so I got my key points here. <clears throat> this is kind of a um, condensed version of kind of some of the things we talked about in the course and things that I think are really important. Um, so we'll talk about making sure that you choose the right practice, making sure that you surround yourself with the necessary people, that you have access to your preferred technology and implants. Um, you know, it's really all about in the beginning, setting yourself up to be successful. Uh, and those things are important for that. Uh, building your patient base, uh, making sure that you stay focused on the patients, and then making sure that you can execute the game plan. Um, so in the beginning, you know, we talk about the practice type. Uh, this seems so obvious when you're out. I think when you're coming out of residency and fellowship, though, it's something that a lot of people don't think about. And that's because we all train in the same type of setting. We all do our residency or the vast majority of us in a large academic center. Um, yet that is what the minority of uh, spine surgeons are actually practicing in. So thinking about whether you want, you know, a private orthopedic group or neurosurgery group, or do you want a group that does only spine surgery or a hospital employed position at like a clinic or at a larger like academic type center? Um, you know, that decision is personal and there's obviously a lot of things that go into it, but that's probably the foundational decision that will color a lot of the other decisions you make after that. I think one of the really big things that was impressed upon me during fellowship and when I talked to, you know, the docs about where I wanted to end up is, you know, making sure that you're choosing a location for your practice that not only has a demand now, but is going to have a demand 25 years from now. You know, if you have this, you know, your full career that you want, you don't want to go to a dying city. It's possible to go somewhere that's very competitive. You just need to know about that. It's obviously easier to go somewhere if there's rapid population growth in terms of uh, trying to gain market share and get a foothold as a new surgeon. Um, and then thinking about what kind of support you're going to have. Are you going to get internal referrals from your partners or from relationships they already have? If so, obviously the ramp up is going to be a lot easier for you than if you're having to essentially hang your own shingle and be the new guy in town, um, especially if the community already has established relationships that they're referring all their patients to. Um, and then in terms of the people, uh, everybody that's listening to this knows this, but it is so crucial to have positive, hardworking, happy people in your office. <clears throat> and that's, you know, the people that you're going to be working with, like your MA or your nurse, but the front desk person, I mean, I've said this a million times, it's mind blowing to me that, um, you know, at a lot of locations, you can pay the front desk person $13 an hour, uh, when that person can literally tank your entire office and practice if they decide to. Um, they're the face of, of your practice and between them and your MA, they're the people that, that are communicating with your patients when they're calling in with issues or making an appointment. So it's important to have the right people there. You know, if you're in an orthopedic group like I am, having builders that understand spine is important and investing in having them trained up if they're not is something that's worth doing. Um, having a device rep that understands uh, your needs is exceedingly important. Um, We'll talk more about this later on, but you know, you really want to avoid being somewhere where they tell you, well, we use Stryker because it makes all of our administrators a, a nice little bonus in December when we use enough of their implants. So that's what you're going to use. And that's all you're going to use. That's a tough proposition. Uh, and, you know, I can deal with that with ortho trauma or something, but with spine, you know, you, you got to know your worth and the leverage that you have and bringing in new business to the hospital and making sure that you can use the implants that you think are best for your patients and having a rep or a distributor that can provide you with options and backup options is really important. As a young surgeon, that's something that uh, you wanna spend that downtime in between fellowship and working, making sure that you have built the foundation for that so you're not figuring it out as you go. Um, and then think about as things mature and you get busier, reasonable to consider a scribe or a scribe service and a mid-level provider to help extend what you wanna do. Um, I'll tell you, I, like I got a scribe service about, um, three months ago, and I went up 30% in the number of patients I'm seeing per clinic day. I go home and I'm done. I don't have any notes to do. I get there 30 minutes early the next day and review all the notes and sign them. So I'm spending more time with my kids. I'm seeing more patients and the extra patients are actually paying for 
the scribe service uh, and I'm not having to spend another half day that would be an OR day in clinic. So I can actually keep that OR day open, but still maintain the clinic throughput to keep the OR busy. So uh, it was just a no brainer. Quality of life would have made it a no brainer anyway, but it's actually paying for itself and a few of my partners too. So we're pretty happy with that decision. Um, and then before you sign with the hospital, obviously this is a, something that again, mature surgeons know as a young person, you have a whole lot of leverage before you sign with a group or a hospital and you really wanna get in writing um, everything that you need. So if, if you don't wanna work there, unless there's a robot, get them to write it down. If you need an OR or whatever capital things you need and I have a bunch of it listed here, you, know, you wanna make sure that they agree to get that stuff ahead of time. Asking for it later, you could still get it, but they're going to make you go through a lot more red tape and processes than if you ask for it in the beginning as a contingency for you to do work there or to sign with the group. Um, and then we talked about this a minute ago with the implants. Yeah, I'm just a big, I'm kind of on the extreme end of this. Um, I really believe in patient uh, and surgeon autonomy in terms of the implants that I want to use and I think are best for my patient. And I don't use the same thing on everyone. Um, and that goes for whether it's a disc replacement or pedicle screws or whatever it is I'm doing. It's a very patient specific and it's a choice that I make based on them. And I discuss a lot of that with the patients. So I don't want a hospital getting in the way of that. So I uh, work pretty hard to make sure that we'll have available all the things that we want to use. And then as you're building your patient base, this is the thing that no one gets any training in unless you go to a fellowship where they talk about it or a residency that where they talk about it. Otherwise, we're not taught how to market. We're not marketing majors, you know, we're surgeons. Um, so you want to use some of the tools that you have there. If the hospital has a marketing department, call them and put it on it. If your group has a marketing department, make sure that they're staying on their job and doing things for you they should be doing. And in 2021, a lot of that obviously is digital advertising, but there's still a role for print advertising for billboards in the right place for radio ads, all that stuff, especially as you get started, that's when you want to do your little quick two minute segment with a local news channel or do a little radio ad or do some community talks. Those you'll have the time to do them early on and that will kind of help build interest and build a base a little bit. Um, and then your other people in your practice, <coughs> they're already going to have relationships with current primary care doctors. And what my partner in my office is a general orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Mayfield, when we were going around shaking hands at all these primary care doctor's offices and we put a smile on and we're bringing cupcakes and keychains, you know, that the thing that ends up happening is someone finds out I'm Dr. Mayfield's partner and they'll just turn around to their front desk and they'll say, Hey, Dr. Mayfield does spine now. And I don't care that that's how they think of it. That's excellent. Um, Cause it just means that they trust Dr. Mayfield. And if I'm coming in to join him, then that's good enough. So leaning on those relationships can certainly help you in the beginning, build some other base um, going door to door and meeting, uh, these doctors is really important. Just put yourself in that primary care doctor's shoe or that ER doctor's shoe. Like They have to find a safe place for their patients to go to. And they want someone that's personable, that seems normal, that seems like they're up to date with technology, but they're not crazy. And if you can convey that in a few minutes, you're probably going to get a few patients out of it. Once those patients are happy because you didn't operate on them and they got better with an injection or you did a surgery and they recovered well, that the feedback is, is pretty extreme early on. Um, and then I would just say, get involved. You know, you have more time in the beginning because you'll have those clinics where you have like two patients there. Um, that's the time to sign up for the committees in the hospital. They're always looking for people to be on the pharmacy committee or the surgery committee or whatever. It shows interest, it's investment. It's the right thing to do. I mean, to be a team player, um, I think it's just a great way to show your interest. And you can use that later on when you need something to be like, hey, look, I'm here. I'm showing up at 6.30 before my cases to do this meeting because you needed a surgeon here. And, I need you to help me with this other thing. It, it, it does come into play. Um, <clears throat> focusing on the patients, obviously exceedingly important. Um, I put this in the beginning because I noticed this and my co-fellows at different parts of the country have had similar experiences that a lot of the patients you're going to get in the beginning are these patients that have chronic pain and the primary care doc is like, yes, I just saw Dr. Burleson yesterday and I have this patient that comes in every week with back pain. I'll send him over there. So you're going to get some of those. And then you get the ones that have been bounced around through all the surgeons that maybe people have either all said no to, or in some unfortunate situations, they've all operated on and they're going to come and see you. And, you know, when you're sitting on your hands for two months, not operating, um, you, you get a little antsy and you want to, you know, you want to operate, you just spend all this time training to be a surgeon. That's like, let's go be a surgeon. But it is really important to slow down, um, make sure that you're indicating people for the correct surgeries. Um, you know, I always say as my bottom thing here, my office gets so tired of hearing me saying this, but I only swing at home runs. Um, I mean, 
I, I don't like telling someone that I can't help them, but if I can't, then I can't. And I think patients end up appreciating that honesty a lot more than you think they will. Uh, so unless I see a clear path to the patient improving at a very high likelihood based on their symptoms, the MRI, everything matching, then I explain that to them and explain to them why I don't think I can help them with the procedure or send them to an injectionist or whatever it is that we're going to do. Um, but it's important to stay focused on that and don't get knife happy. Um, and then let's see. Um, the last thing is you have to execute. And this is where the training matters. Um, unfortunately, the training didn't stop at the end of fellowship, just like everywhere along the way, you know, in medical school, I remember taking the last test, thinking I graduated, I'm done with tests. And then you go to residency and you take all the OITEs and then you take the boards and then th there's always something else. And from a training perspective, I think what happens is you, ha you have a lot of the knowledge now and there's still more to acquire, but you have a lot of it, but you haven't actually done a whole lot of it yet yourself. And what I've kind of realized is, you know, Gladwell kind of popularized the 10,000 hour theory. We've all kind of hit that through residency and fellowship. And unfortunately, what I figured out this year is it completely starts over. <laughs> There's like another 10,000 hours you have to do that's based on you doing things the way you want to do, figuring out your efficiencies in the OR and how you want the staff to set things up, which is for me changed 10 times in the last year. Now, finally reaching some steady state learning how to be good at what you do and not being able to ask at the very end, that looks good, right? I like, I didn't realize how much I was relying on that phrase. You do everything and you're like, yeah, I'm done. That looks good, right? And that actually provided me with a lot more relief than I thought it did because now I can't do that. Or I'm asking an x-ray tech that for no reason because they don't know, but they will say yes every time. You know, so the little things like learning how you want to do this in practice is, is different and important. And it's, it takes continued effort at the same level that you were putting in effort as a resident and a fellow to be the, the good surgeon that you can be and to be the doctor that you would want to be for your patients because you would want that type of doctor for yourself. Um, so, you know, it's maintaining relationships with the team around you, making sure that they see you as a leader and that they respect you, but that also that you're a kind individual that they want to spend time with. We've all been in the operating room or walking by the board when someone rolls their eyes and says, oh, Dr. X just put on a case and I have to do it. Like none of us want to be that doctor. Um, so I, you know, I'm very respectful to people and I, I'm terrible with names, but I make a really big deal out of learning all of their names. Um, and then overbook the time of the cases, probably single best surgical advice I could give a young surgeon. If you're doing your first, you know, two level laminectomy, just book it for four hours. Just do it. Half the staff is not going to know the difference. And if you do it in two and a half hours, you look like a rock star. Um, and it's much better to do that than to book it for two and take two and a half. Cause for the last 30 minutes, everyone's rolling their eyes, wondering why they're still there. And it's just a, a it's a team building. It gets people on your side. Um, and then the, for me, that goes hand in hand with like, I'm slower than I thought I was, right? Like I thought I was pretty fast and I was doing a lot of this. Not that speed is the only thing that matters, but I'm a lot slower because I'm, I don't want to leave unless I know that it's perfect or, you know, adequate. Um, so just be prepared for that. I think that's pretty normal. And then the last point that, you know, everyone's told me, so I'm just passing on this information because I think it's incredibly true is, you know, yeah, you've, you've made it to the point where you have like a big boy job. I will tell you and caution you that comes with big boy bills and responsibility. Um, but you have to keep the mindset of kind of the underdog mindset. I'm still trying to grow. I'm still trying to improve. I'm still trying to be better. I ask for advice from the people around me if it can help me. Um, and just maintaining that attitude, I think, um, you, you know, will ultimately keep you uh, progressing forward and adopting new things and, and finding the best solutions for your patients. So my last slide is that through all of this, I think the most important thing is to make sure that you remember why you're doing all this stuff. Um, if you have a real, you know, why friends, family activities outside of work, you know, it makes it a lot easier to understand why you're working a little bit harder. Because for me, you know, one of the things that I heard in fellowship all the time is like the family rule, what would you want your families done for them is that I think of this the same way, like the level of care that I would want the people that are important to me to receive is the level of care that I want to provide. And the patient that's taken 30 minutes in the clinic talking about, you know, their grandkid, and I'm like 20 minutes behind, you know what, like, I would want someone to listen to my mom if she was 80 and no one was really listening to her and she got to go see a doctor this week. So like be a human being, you know, so that type of thing and, and the stuff outside of work, I think is really important. So I've tried to maintain that this year. So thank you all very much.
Great job, John. I want to uh, point out to the audience, uh, you and your colleagues, uh, Dr. Webb and others have done a fantastic job with the Young Surgeons uh, programs on SSF TV. So uh, really kudos and all of us old geezers are not allowed to participate except for listening. And I, I actually learned a lot and the programs are really compelling. So uh, kudos to you to really uh, create a new information and exchange platform for young surgeons. Thank you. Uh, proctoring. So you mentioned, oh, if I'm doing a decompression, I'll book it as four hours and uh, then I'll shine by doing it in two hours. I've had a number of fellows tell me that the proctoring at hospitals can be very hostile where an older geezer surgeon staying with a theme um, kind of comments on, oh, I can do this in half an hour or 45 minutes and uh, surgeon so-and-so is way too slow. Um, so uh, what are your, what's your advice and what's your experience been as you're uh, canvassing uh, the country uh, with your tremendous response to this uh, new program in terms of hostile proctoring from older surgeons? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I think it is highly dependent on your setting. So like I don't have formal proctoring, you know, in my, uh, I'm at an HCA facility here in an ortho group with about 20 docs. Um, but, and I will admit that the two spine surgeons that are at my hospital, which are in competing groups are extremely collegial towards me. But I think in general, this has come up before. My attitude towards it is an, an, basically an athlete attitude, which is, You've been in the locker room before and the coach says like, listen, there's a lot of noise outside. I don't really care about that. We're going to get done what we need to get done. And that's how we're going to win. And I think that type of mentality about if the staff says something and that's how you're hearing is like, great, if he can do it in, you know, an hour and a half. Awesome. I'm going to get there someday, but I'm the surgeon doing this case. And for me, it takes me two and a half hours, three hours to do it safely. And this kind of gets back into one of the things where, not to go off on a wild tangent, but with robotics, where some of the more senior surgeons will say, well, I don't need a robot to put in a pedicle screw because I can do them in two minutes now and my revision rate is 1%. And my answer to that is always, great, at 55, you've achieved that. Were you there at 35? Because if you weren't, then you, what I'm arguing is that we're looking for repeatable good results in the best situation for everyone. And that's why I'm an, a robot advocate because I think robots can help good surgeons that aren't great surgeons yet be reproducibly good sooner with more efficient surgery. And I think in this situation is, okay, well, maybe you can do that. But in my environment, in my reality, for me, it takes me this long. And I know just like the more senior surgeon knows that everyone has a learning curve, but I, you know, first and foremost, I don't take it personally. I'm going to do what I have to do. And I found that patients don't seem to mind, even if they say, oh, that's going to be three hours. I tell them, yeah, you know, I really don't like to close up until I'm sure. And they always say, you know what, we don't want you to close up either until you're sure. So I, I found that I'm not encountering that a lot personally, but I think that other people do. And I just think it's one of those things that you can't take it personally and you have to do what's best for the patient and just try and keep that in mind. So much more to talk about. And again, I hope that uh, many people in the audience who did not know of your Young Surgeons Forum will uh, continue to dial in. We must move on. We're a little bit late and I was at fault because I was so slow in my foraminotomy. Uh, but thank you, John, and uh, see you around soon, okay?